whatever I uh, am saying, but uh, I would like just to thank you very uh, much. Uh, thank you for accepting this uh, invitation to deliver. Uh, the Thanks lectures. for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we are very happy uh, to have you. And uh, I just want to say to our uh, community, our participants, that uh, Mate is a PhD candidate in computer science under Professor Christian Kersting at the uh, Technical University of Darmstadt. And uh, his research involves uh, uh, causal inference, neural causal inference, uh, role of causality in machine learning, and also uh, connected also to uh, what we discussed uh, first two days, uh, explainable uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I must say that uh, I was impressed how Mate is active in the community organizing workshops and uh, also uh, seems very passionate about maths, causality and machine learning. So I'm really, really looking forward uh, to your lectures. Today. And uh, I must just say uh, one more thing. Uh, we, uh, we practiced uh, uh, the questions and answers so that uh, people would write uh, down uh, uh, in chat box the, the questions and they can be addressed after the lecture by the order they come. Or if you prefer, uh, we can also uh, do it uh, so that, that people just raise hands and uh, interrupt your presentation if they find something interesting and important to question, whatever you uh, uh, want. Cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, at any time, really, um, interrupting is always good. Um, but I will also have kind of, you know, chapter wise segments. So we can always also ask questions after those. And then uh, I think also at the end. It seems that some of my students are just uh, driving the bike uh, <laughs> to get on the lectures. I, I, I can see it. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, so. Please, uh, Matej, you can start. Yeah. Great. OK, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today at this International Summer School on Data Science. Um, it was the first time hearing about this, and I'm super happy to see that there's, you know, initiatives um, or like, like these summer schools. Uh, I have been part of the Eastern European Machine Learning Summer School, for instance, oh. uh, also a great school. Uh, and I, I think it's just amazing to have these kind of events. And I'm grateful to be here and uh, thanks again on this side. Um, yeah, so today we're going to have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, broadly, the topic will be like this, right? Causality for machine learning one, right? So so the one implies that there will be a part two and there will be. Um, and yeah, my name is Matej Zetrich and um, yeah, I'm affiliated with the TU Darmstadt, as just said, with Professor Christian Kersting and with many other amazing collaborators. Um, and yeah, without them, this would not have been possible. So let's get right into it. So today, what do we have today? So right now from 9 a.m. early in the morning, especially for PhD students to approximately half past, uh, including the, the Q&A, uh, we'll do this first lecture. And really in this lecture, we are going to explore basic concepts, right? So um, we, are, we are really going to talk about all the stuff we need to then eventually in our second lecture, which is then from 10.45, uh, um, yeah, discuss ongoing stuff, right? Like recent, like cutting edge research, right? Um, and then actually the third time is a charm, right? So you will have me in the afternoon as well, and we are gonna do a hands-on session, right? So, so I've prepared some code base for us to, to you know, go over and, and, and learn with that and explore some concepts that we will see today uh, in the lectures but also some other concepts which are fairly related, right? But I mean, there's so much to explore. Let's go into it, right? Um, yeah, let's let's start here with the references, right? So uh, the the slides will be available publicly, right? So you can have them on GitHub and, and also the code base. Uh, so don't worry there. Uh, we'll make sure to share that with you. Um, other than that, um, we'll be looking at these different uh, uh, or, or, or parts of all of these different resources we are having here. So obviously the book by Judah Pearl, who is the 
pioneer in this field or whose version of causality, if we want to say so, we are going to use today. Um, that book had a second edition in 2009, and who knows, maybe a third edition will come soon, right? So it's, it's been long overdue. Um, the second book is this one, right? It's, it's uh, Elements of Causal Inference, um, fairly recent book, as you can see. So it was just published 2017, and um, it's coming more from the machine learning side of things, right? So, so we'll see a lot of aspects also from, from that one. Um, and then, yeah, there's always, you know, great lectures available out there as well, fortunately, right? So, so one of them is from Elias Barenboim. Uh, there's also a free online course, actually, right, which you can just, you know, attend, and 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 also a mini lecture series by the, by the first author of 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 this book. Um, yeah, and and as you can already see, right? So, so this is the school of, of data science, right? And it's pretty cool because, um, yeah, you can see uh, that that as a term that is actually used in causality, right? Uh, if if you ask him, right, Judah Pearl, he would just say, yeah, cut the causal because there is no data science, there is no science, of science right? Um, and, and we're going to explore, like, well, what that really means in this case, right? Um, yeah, again, questions at any time, right? I'll have chapter-wise uh, pointers uh, and, and might be looking um, to, to, to then, you know, answer questions, uh, but really any time. Let, let's keep this interactive. Um, can you still see me? The Teams is telling me that my video stopped. It sometimes stops, uh, but the slides and sound are here. Oh, okay, so you are okay. now captured in some, uh, you know, position and nothing is happening. Mm, okay, but okay. Uh, as, as to the slides and the sound, it's uh, quite good. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me just check. I'll, I'll just try this once. So, so let's just... Um, um, Turn this off and then now let's just turn it on back. So is it working now, hopefully? Uh, yes, yes, it seems so. Now uh -huh. we see you uh, as a movie. OK, as a snapshot. Great, <laughs> great, great. That, that's that's reassuring that this works. OK, cool. Yeah. And then also, I mean, just just going back to today's program, right? So um, um, really, there's a lot of ground to cover, right? And we cannot do everything. We are focusing on, on the machine learning parts in that sense, but of course, we need some of the just causal basics. Um, and um, yeah, all of this was also done a little bit, you know, uh, on, 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 on the last minute. So so if I say some gibberish or, or I'm acting a little bit tired, please uh, wake me up, please remind me. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's why active sessions are always great. Cool. Um, yeah, so this lecture really mostly will be based on, on these two books. Uh, I, I think it's it's pretty cool to do it with the books because, you know, then when you explore the books for yourself, maybe uh, out of interest or, or because you're working in this field, then uh, this goes a lot easier. And then, well, there's a, a stronghold, which is this causal AI lab at Columbia University in New York, uh, led by one of Perl's student, Elias Barenboim, uh, and they've also contributed a lot of things. Uh, of course, there's many other labs, right? There's there's our labs, there's the lab in Tübingen, there's the labs in, in, in Amsterdam and in, in London and, and even other places, right? But I'm just saying like that this lecture specifically is, is mostly based on, on, on stuff that you'll find here. Uh, and usually references will be given like this. And always feel free to reach out to me afterwards, right? For any specific uh, references. Um, also going back to this one. So, so you see we are going for 1030, which means we'll aim for like one hour and 10 minutes of, of main content plus minus and then you know uh, that we have also some time for some extended discussion cool now let's look at some some maths some notation right which we're going to employ right so um i'll try to be consistent um but then again really <laughs> the community itself is not really consistent about it yet um in general you know we we denote by these capital letters we denote random variables and then, you know, this would be a value uh, for that random variable X. And then boldface will usually be a vector. Uh, we always consider these uh, independent and identically distributed uh, samples, right? In, in machine learning, the, the big underlying assumption. Um, P will usually not be a random variable. It will be denoting a probability measure. And so it can be either distribution or density. Um, and then, you know, standard operators we know from statistics, expectation, the expected value, the mean, the covariance, the variance, right? Then something we'll use a lot as well at later points, right? So unfortunately, yesterday's uh, lecture fell short, right, because of illness, but um, it'll, you know, cover these things, in, especially in, in, in causal structure learning. 
Um, yeah, this will usually denote uh, the structural causal model, which is at the center, as we'll see, of, 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 of the causality as, as we are using it here. Um, a graph usually denoted like this in the same calligraphic style. Um, PA usually stands for parents, right? It's a very important concept. And um, yeah, this is the do operator. Don't worry about this now. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. And then, you know, things like this, uh, just, you know, standard probability theory, uh, meaning, you know, conditional distributions and so on and so forth, base, base rule, and then, you know, applying it and transforming your data. So now we start with chapter one, right? So the big question, why? Yeah, so why in this case stands short for, you know, why does machine learning need causality? So in, in this chapter, we really want to explore um, kind of the necessity that machine learning might have and as we'll see it it, it has it right so uh, this is what we are going to talk about here so but before we start with that right the first question should be yeah what is causality right um and and, and causality is a huge term right i mean you go to a physicist he's going to tell you something different then you, you go to a philosopher they're going to tell you something different and you come to me and well i might mention at least those those at, at least i'm trying to mention these people right um, and, and yeah, so, so you will see here that probably uh, this ancient Greek philosopher, Plato, was the first to state the principle of causality, right? And, and you see it, it's saying something like everything that becomes or changes uh, must do so, right? Like it's, it's, it's something, it, it's, it's like a force of nature in a sense, uh, owing to some cause, right? Like that there is some cause without now here defining what a cause is, but something, you know, which is account, held accountable for the other thing. Um, and and really it's it's absolute right so it's so like for nothing can come without a cause and so you see that people have been wondering about this question for a long time i mean we always remember this you know correlation does not equal causation right and and we'll see examples of that actually um but in general right causality is really just a, a, a thing which is at, at the core of human cognition even right like we 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 think causally right like we we just imagine alternative scenarios we 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 can reason about what really was the reason right like the word reason of something right and so so in that sense you know causality has been studied for eons essentially right um Today, though, we are going to look at a specific theory. So, so there's also things like Granger causality and other things, right, uh, which have been, you know, more modern concepts of, of causality, not just, you know, the ancient Greek stuff. Um, and, and one of these, these theories is actually this theory provided by Judah Pearl, um, which is a counterfactual theory, right? So, so really the, the big word is, is, is this one, right? So it's a, it's a counterfactual theory, and, and, and we'll get to that, what that really means, right? I mean, you could in, intuitively probably now imagine, right, like, there's some kind of fact and, and now we're countering that fact and it's something different, right? And, and that already shows you this, you know, alternative nature of, of consideration. And that's really at the core of it because it'll stand at the top um, and, and this we'll see in a moment. So um, in words, we can summarize, you know, this theory uh, or, or as Pearl himself would, would do it with really two fundamental laws, right? So um, these, these laws of causal inference, one of them is uh, about these counterfactuals, right? That, you know, given a structural causal model, the thing we saw earlier, which we are going to formalize uh, in a bit, um, that you can really get them, right? Like you can deduce them, right? Whether you have access to the STM then is a different question. Usually you don't. You don't. Um, but that's the, the first thing that, that at least this formalism for the model exists, right? Like there's this language for doing this. Um, and then the second thing, is um, that you know these features of the observed data are actually shaped right like in general anything you'll observe is really respecting the structure right like that's the s of the scm right like the structural causal model right there's there some some underlying uh graph structure yeah? and so these are the two fundamental laws put in in, in words right so so if we say we want to remember two things then two very important things to this notion of pearl is you can talk about counterfactuals, whatever they mean, and we'll see that in a minute. And um, how do, uh, yeah, uh, that there is this graph structure, right, like which is underlying the SCM. So in the following, we'll also just, you know, we'll usually just say causality, right? But in, implicitly, you know, it, it just stands for Perlian causality, right? Because it was first formalized by, by Perl. 
Um, and, and why did we choose this one, right? Like, that's a totally fair question. And um, well, in AI and ML, so far at least, uh, this was the the formalization which got us got us the furthest in a sense, right? Uh, still not in the sense that you know, without spoiling too much, but still not in the sense that we had like an image net moment. Otherwise, you would have probably heard about it, um, or we we'd be closer to AGI, right? Um, but but still by far far the best one, right? Because it really you you, you can you can implement these things, right? And and so I guess this was a, a, a great deal of that, right? Um, and actually, what is really interesting to me is is this aspect, right? So, so we are also today at some point going to talk about, you know, um, ex explainability, explainable AI, and so on. And um, in cognitive science, right, like the, the study of of human cognition, um, well, they they've shown actually support for you know key ideas, right, of of the formalism of Perl, right. So, so they actually could show something like you know humans reason counterfactually and um, that's actually super super great because uh, with that you know you 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 give a lot of credibility to the theory as as a general theory of causality. Um, of course, there's no statements about completion or anything, which means um, we cannot really um, um, know or, or tell um, you know uh, whether whether this will be all right. Um, but um, it's certainly it's, it's certainly a good hint, right? And um, we can see here down down below with um, this work also from 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 Tobias Gerstenberg. He's a cognitive scientist at Stanford, and um, you see this really interesting setup that he has here. So so let's look first at A, and 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 what you see here is you have these like two two spheres, two balls, A and B, uh, and now A, uh, uh, I mean B, is 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 traveling on this well not so straight line as I drew it. Um, but on this straight trajectory, right? Um, and and this red area here, which is which is marked in there, uh, this is kind of the goal, and 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 or or at least that's a kind of signal. And um, what is happening here now is that this second ball and its trajectory, right? That it's actually intercepting uh, B, and it's changing the path, the trajectory that B is taking. Um, and so what we can kind of conclude is that. A actually caused B to go into the gate, right? But now, interestingly, it it definitely in this case depends on on the parameters and how you specify it, right? Because here we have the setting where B would have gone, right? Like would have gone, right? That's already a causal statement. In even if 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 A wasn't there, right? Like even in any case, B would have gone in, unlike in, in this case where it wouldn't have, right? So, um, and, and they use this kind of setup, right? Like this really simple setup, as you can see, with with, with these spheres and, and this box, um, and then some other complicated stuff where they would, you know, add a, a confounder. We'll see in a minute what that means, right? And then they could even reason counterfactually, right? And and with that, they, they showed this upper point, right? Um, but yeah, I, I re really recommend you to, to check this out. It's, I mean, it's really great work that they've done there. Um, and, and yeah, they, they actually do human experiments, unlike uh, yeah, what we do usually in AI and ML, where we uh, usually just go to the computers. <laughs> so what is the opinion of, of Perl himself? So, so here also for you, if, if you have never seen him before, uh, that's a picture of Perl. He, I, I believe he just celebrated his 86th birthday. Um, he is really the pioneer of, of causality for AI, and uh, he's also a Turing Award, right? So uh, he won his Turing Award for Bayesian networks, right, and 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 for his notion of, of causality, uh, and 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 he's still going strong um, with well over uh, with with many many citations, of course. Uh, I mean, the whole field is essentially building up on it, and and this is this other book, right, which I um, I didn't mention earlier um, because it's more like a um, Kind of uh, populist book. Uh, it's it's really just for the broader audience, right? And and given that we are talking on a technical level, I think the other ones are more relevant. But if you really want to just have some some simple read, I can really recommend this book. And here you can also see in the subtitle is saying like the new science of cause and effect, because um, in, in 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 Pearl's view, uh, it it really is that science is about causality, right? Because uh, we are changing things and we are observing how how that you know, changes the, the system, right? And, and and these experiments, these informed and systematic experiments, they do the learning for us in a sense. Um, yeah, and, and so what is, what is he saying? Well, he's saying that 
he's of course a strong advocate of this and he's saying that well to build truly intelligent machines teach them about cause and effect um and uh well this is really just saying that Pearl believes that to true ai we really need uh, some notions of, of of causation and and that's why he dedicated his life work to, to you know uh do this formalism um, but also there's these controversial statement, right? So, so this one thing which he said in an interview with Quanta magazine, uh, all the impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting, right? And, and that's a harsh statement. Um, technically it is true, right? But that statement because, well, uh, it, it, it kind of, you know, tells you, well, what did deep learning do? It's just curve fitting, but no, that's not true. I mean, it's extremely sophisticated curve fitting, right? And, and, and then there's here and there bounds which are being broken, right? Um, but of course, the agenda here is to, to really advocate the ca causal stuff, and we'll motivate this now. So look at this example. So, so what do we see here? So we have this, uh, this, this scatter plots of some gene A. So, so this is a, a biology example. Some gene A, the activity of gene A, measured on, on you see, the interval 0 to 8, um, and, and some phenotype, right? So something, you know, so some kind of property we are observing. Uh, measured from 0 to 15 here in this case. And you see that all the data is kind of falling in, in, in this area. And, and now the big question I'm asking you is, well, uh, here, right, where the question mark is placed, this uh, vertical line, right? Um, what if we set the activity of gene A to 0? That means we delete uh, this, this, uh, this gene, right? Like, what would that do with the phenotype? That's that's the big question we are asking here. Um, and so, as a machine learning practitioner, what you'll do is is something like this, right? Like you'll you'll fit your ML model, right? Like in this case, well, <laughs> some people might say it's, it's a bit hard to call, you know, the 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 uh, the, the regression here, the the least square regression uh, ML, but well, it, it's learning from data, right? So it's ML, and um, and then you know naturally what you would now conclude is well. Now, now you look at this model, right? And and you say, well, I, I just go to zero. It's it's this area, right? So I expect the phenotype to be in here somewhere, right? And so now, if we resolve this, right, and we see, hey, we are correct, right? Um, and and what you see here is is the causal model, right? So they, you know, gene A is actually causing the phenotype, right? And so of course, if if we you know like predict here in this area, well, because we change actively at gene A, right? We delete it, the the phenotype goes goes down as well right but now let me give you a second example right and in the second example it looks very familiar uh, familiar right like it's it's very similar um but it's not the same right like this is gene b right like it's a different gene and the, the plot does look very similar and again i'm asking the the same question like what what happens when i when i delete gene b right and again as a great machine learning practitioner you know you'll you'll fit your ml model again and all of it looks very similar and you go, OK, let's go with this one, right? That, that's my educated guess. <laughs> Turns out, though, <laughs> that in this case, you would be wrong, right? And, and, and see, so, so the phenotype is actually located somewhere here when you delete gene B, right? And why is that so? It's because of the causal graph here, right? And what is this? So it's saying that the gene B and the phenotype they are caused by this confounder. A confounder is just a different word for a common cause, right? There's a common cause. There's an arrow pointing from this confounder to the phenotype NGB, right? Whatever that is, right? In this case, it can be a hidden confounder, right? Like we still just observe those two, but that's the true underlying structure of the data generating problem, right? Like that's what generated this data. And in this case, you can see now, right, that um, had you predicted here, I mean, you would have gone very, very wrong with 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 this difference, right? And, and now you can already imagine, right, that in safety critical setups, right? I mean, you you essentially lose, especially. I mean, this is even a biology example. Imagine you have some medication coming out of this eventually, um, not just the cost, but also in general, like in 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 a financial sense, but like also the 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 harm that you might do to individuals. It, can be great, right? And so, so really, this is the big picture, right? Uh, and and this is really taking as a motivation from the book, from from Jonas Peters et al., um, where you really see two similar scenarios, right? Gene A and Gene B, but they behave very, very differently when you when you ask them about the interventions, right? When you ask them about what happens, 
and 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 quite frankly, right? I mean, you 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 fitted both these lines here, right? And 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 the only thing you can really do is say I don't know, if you say you don't want to talk about the causal assumptions, right? But that's a great thing because if you talk about these causal assumptions, then you actually can do this, right? And that's the whole idea, right? That that's the big big view, the motivation here, um, which kind of motivates our initial question from this chapter, right? Uh, why? Well, why do we need causality for machine learning? Well, because machine learning will, will suck out, outside of the domain without the assumptions, right? So where does this come from, right? So this actually comes from this uh, German physicist, Reichenbach, um, and it's called this common cause principle. And, and really what this principle is saying that, you know, if you have these two random variables, say X and Y, um, and they are statistically dependent, right? So, so that's the symbol here with the strike. There is a third variable that causally influences both, right? And as a special case, this principle actually contains that, you know, Z may coincide with, with either X or Y, right? So uh, it could be, you know, Z could be X, Z could be Y, or Z could be actually a separate entity. Um, and, and it is said that this variable screens off, right, X and Y from each other so that they become conditionally independent. So that's really the principle which kind of explains what we've just seen now. And depicted in graphs, this really looks like this, right? Uh, I mean, this is simple graphs, but you can imagine that these structures appear in all bigger graphs as, as subgraphs, right? And, and either it is that X is causing Y or, or the other way around, or that there's a potentially hidden cause, and that's why we are drawing it here with the dot, dotted lines, right? Uh, which is causing causing both of them, right? So, so in a sense, what you would see here is, you know, that there is this relation, but it's kind of hidden to you, and it appears as if they are causally related, like in, in these cases, uh, although they are not, right? Although they are not, because, well, they are caused by, by Z. So, really, to summarize this, this first section, um, yeah, causality allows us really to talk about modeling assumptions. So, uh, in that sense, these two paradigms are actually quite different, right? Like in AI and machine learning, you you usually just, you know, you go with the data and, and, and everything is derived from there, right? It's very autonomous, right? That's the whole goal, autonomy. Um, but in causality, it's, it's really like, it feels like we still have this human component because it's about modeling assumptions, like like what kind of setting are you actually looking at, right? And before we are able to, uh, you know, make make these automatic these assumptions and, and finding those and testing those, um, it it will be like that, right? Um, and then also, what it really allows us to talk about is this data generating process, right? So uh, you saw that we had these activities of these genes plotted, right? And, and they looked similar, and these were the distributions, and these were joint distributions, right? Like of the activity of the gene and the phenotype. And, and usually in statistics, this is all you need, right? Because from, from the joint distribution of all my variables, if I, if I know that, I can derive anything else, right? Like I use probability theory, base rules, and so on. And, and I get any conditional I want and, 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 and any marginal I want, right? Uh, whether I can compute it, it's a different story, but like just theoretically, right? Um, and, and so here in causality, we actually talk about an instance which is higher up. We talk about the thing which generates this distribution, right? So it's really one level in, in the hierarchy. So um, maybe we can just take any questions if there are uh, any at this point. Um, you can also look in the chat. Um, so is there any? No, I, I don't see anything so far. OK. So please also remind me if there's like any questions or anything. So then chapter two here, the what, right? Like we saw the why and, and, and now the what, right? Like, OK, you talked about this and, and it makes sense. I hope it makes sense now, right? But um, what does it actually look like? What does Perlin Cousin look like? So um, you probably all know probabilistic inference, right? Um, but now we're talking about causal inference, right? And 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 as we have seen, there is kind of this intuition that we have now that that causality is is is, is a level above, right? And indeed, this is what we see with these errors here. The subsuming in this case just means that you know any probabilistic model you'll get out of causal model, out of some causal model. And and so anything you observe classically in probabilistic learning where you know, you can reason with it and you can learn from it um, is also just part of this bigger thing, which uh, allows you to reason about change and which allows you to reason about 
uh, alternative worlds, which in this case would be the counterfactuals, right? So this is kind of this uh, commutative diagram view on this thing. And now let's start with the hierarchy, right? So, so we saw, okay, there's these different levels of, of reasoning, but what, what are those, right? And so there's three levels to this, right? And, and we are going through them. So the first is what we call association uh, or, or just observations or, or statistics really, right? And, and, and the activity is really just seeing and observing, right? So typical questions would be something like, what if I see something, how does that change my belief, right? So if I, if I observe, for example, um, a certain system, what does that tell me? What does that change about my belief in a disease, right? Like if, if someone, someone has a headache, uh, I'm probably not concluding that they are uh, having a broken leg or something, right? So this is all we know so far, right? And now with level two, right? we actually get onto the causal stuff, right? So, so level two are interventions. And so the activity is, is really, it, it feels interactive in this case, right? Because you're actually changing something. And the typical question would be something like, what if I do, right? Or, or how can I get something? And, and, and the typical example would be here also in line with the previous one. Well, if I take an aspirin, will my headache, headache be occurred, right? Like, uh, you know, you could look at, you know, whether your friend took an aspirin and whether the headache was occurred, right? That would be in level one, right? But here, you're just now saying, okay, if I take now an aspirin, right? Like, like I actually do it, right? Then will that actually cure my headache, right? So, so here you're already talking about experiments, right? So uh, on a machine learning level, you, you might compare this now to something like reinforcement learning, right? Where actually there's an agent interacting with an environment and a mark of decision process. And now finally, level three, right? So the counterfactuals, right? This is like what we saw in the beginning, right? Counterfactual theory. Um, this is really where, where it gets very, very interesting because this is something like imagining, retrospection, understanding. It's going back in time. Well, well, you know, the interventions, they are something hypothetical, you know, I'm asking like, okay, if I take the aspirin now, how will that affect me? Here in the counterfactual, it's a bit different. It's really like, um, um, you know, going back in time, like like reflecting on what, what you have seen. So, so the question would be like, not just what if, but what if I had done? Like, what if something, something, right? And um, really to, to keep it consistent with the previous example, Imagine, you know, uh, you, you had taken the aspirin, right, and, and, and your headache was cured, and now you reflect on that. You ask yourself, okay, what if I had not taken the aspirin? Would my headache have gone anyway, right? So that's really a thing. It's like an attribution, essentially, like in, in a trial, and that's why also counterfactuals become relevant in, in, in the law, law enforcement and these kinds of things, right? So, so really, it's like after having observed the world, you, 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 you question that one. And so here is the big picture. Uh, it's also again taken from this, this book of why. Um, and there's also this really nice illustration now highlighting it, uh, how this, this letter is really going upwards and um, what kind of entities you might find there, right? Like depicted visually. So, so any Pearl would argue that any, you know, uh, current robotic system or, or for example, animals, right? An owl, which is, you know, a predator and, and, and chasing, uh, 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 smaller animals on, on the ground, right? That they are just doing the scene, right? Like they can predict things and that's already super powerful. I mean, that's essentially all of statistics, right? But now uh, if you go on the letter two, you have something like the Neanderthals, the hominin and, and, and you know, the, the, the um, toddlers and, and, and well, what do they do, right? Like a toddler will just, you know, throw something off the table, uh, see, you know, what it feels like to stand and so on and so forth, right? And these are all experiments essentially, right? Uh, it's, it's really like, you can imagine the Neanderthal, you know, rubbing sticks together on with, with stones and then, you know, making fire, right? So, so that's really uh, interacting with the environment and, and then, you know, observing its consequences. And, and through that coming to causal conclusions. And then, well, this famous person, Einstein, right, we have on this, this top rung, on this top level, which is really the counterfactuals, right? And, and now you can see, you know, these are the things which Pearl imagines, you know, can, can really give you uh, rise to all, all the great power that, that we humans have, right? And that's really just going back and, and, and even debugging, right? Like uh, asking yourself, okay, what would I have had to do differently such that my code would work, right? Like where, where's the fix, right? So that's really the, the hierarchy. And so what stands at this hierarchy? So, so now we are getting it back, back in, into a little bit of notation and maths. So, so really 
this structural causal model, right? The SCM for short. This is really at, at the core thing. And, and sometimes in the literature, that's why I said like the notation is not always consistent. You'll find things like SEM uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, people will use different names to refer to the same thing and different notation. But really, what are some of the key properties? So it is a tuple. So that's how you specify the model, similar to like a Markov decision process. And then, you know, V is, is your en uh, endogenous variables. So your system variables, things that you observe, say, say you know, uh, whether you took an aspirin and uh, whether, you know, your headache was cured, for instance, right? Then you are all these exogenous variables, all the things which you don't directly observe, latent, we call them in machine learning usually, right? And, and they affect those, right? And they are, you know, you can also see them as noise, but you can also remember the U as unmodeled, right? Like it's really just everything else we are missing in our modeling. And then there are these functions, and, and these are now these structural equations, these deterministic functions, right? However, which use these noise terms, that's why, you know, we have distributions. Um, and it really looks like this, right? So, so for any you know uh, element in this this uh, of our system variables, its value is going to be defined by this function, the parents of that variable, and some noise, right? So, so these are the components which go in there. And and and, and again, right? Like these uh, exogenous variables, you can see them as a noise, right? And and they have some kind of probability distribution. Um, and that implies also then automatically that you have some probability distribution over your uh, endogenous variables, right? Um, and a big assumption which is usually made, right? I mean, recently people like, uh, you know, Bongas uh, et al, they um, uh, looked at how to fix this, but generally we have no uh, no cycles, right? Like uh, no, no feedback loops uh, in these systems. And, and that's, I guess, also historically because these models developed from the BN, right? Like there was the Bayesian network, then came, you know, the causal Bayesian network, and then came the SCM. And really, you can also call the SCM a functional Bayesian network. That, that's the hierarchy. Okay, so <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> a bit of notation, but we'll go through it one by one. So interventions, right? We said like that they already lie on, on, on level two, um, and, and they are about changing the equations, these structural equations. So, so here we have an example model, right? So we have these two uh, va uh, endogenous variables, X and Y. And now we have here three noise terms, actually, like one for, for each of, of the variables and then one which is shared, right? This is something which is then known as Markovianity in the literature, right? Which is just telling you like whether there's some, some other, you know, spurious relation between the variables. And, 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 and these are the equations, right? There's one for uh, X and one for Y. And, and what this model really implies is, is something like this, that the, the marginal uh, uh, probability of, say, observing Y in, in, in state small Y um, is, is not the same as conditioning, right? Like that they are, not, uh, uh, they are not independent, right? Because if you look at this thing, which really is saying um, that uh, uh, X is causing Y, and and they are they are not independent. However, um, really to see this, we have to do uh, do right. Like I already used the word, we have to do an intervention. And and the do is quite literally doing something, right? So you're saying that you're setting x to this little x value, right? And now you look. So there's this equation, right? And and now it's just this, right? Like you replace the whole part, right? Like all of it is is just being replaced by that value. This is what is known as a hard intervention, right? We are not going to specify this this much, like a hard or a perfect intervention. There are soft ones, right, where you could imagine you'll you'll write something like, uh, you know, x is just uh, a, a different function of, of of some argument. But in general, what you'll see most often is is this type of intervention, right? Um, and and what this really applies is the following that. Actually, um, you know the 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 intervention is, is 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 the interventional distribution. The causal effect is not the same as just predicting the marginal, and and this really shows you that you know x causes uh, y. So, and what we also usually do is like if we have, for example, this. I mean, this is I believe what is great notation. You know, you have here uh, the the little x, x highlighting that you know. This this equation was replaced essentially, right? 
how do you get counterfactuals now? So we're not going to go in detail now here, um, but we'll just show the procedure. So it's like this one, two, three step procedure. So you have these, these uh, distribution over the, the noise terms, right? And and given some evidence, right? And and this could really just, just be some observation of, of I don't know, like uh, X, uh, Y, and, and whatever your variables are. And, and they kind of have some implications on, on, on the U, on the U terms. And, and, and you update this belief, and then you just proceed with an intervention. Then you just do your intervention and, and predict, and that already gives you counterfactual. Because in a counterfactual, what you're doing is really, you're keeping everything fixed, right? Like, so, so you have some belief about the U and you're keeping that fixed and now doing an intervention, right? These, these things, this is one world in a sense, and then this thing is the second world and you're kind of comparing them. But it's not restricted to just two worlds only, right? Like this is a general formalism um, and, and in the references, you will find definitely pointers to that if you're more interested in that. So what about the causal graph, right? So, so we talked about these SCMs now for a minute. And actually it turns out that the causal graph, right? Um, that was the second law of, of, of causal inference that we saw. Uh, it's really just an induced property. Uh, of the SCM. So um, usually, right, as I told you earlier, the SCM is latent. So so here, uh, you know, this is M, and I'm just using now the equations lazily uh, in, in, in this box, um, because they are the, the key property which are de determining the structure now. Because if you look now at the equation, so we have three variables, right? So we have X, Y, and Z. Those are that ones, right? And, and, and we know they have some kind of names, so, so something like, you know, drug, headache, disease, I mean, that's your modeling choice. And now all of them are determined by all these equations. And now what you just have to do is look into the arguments, right? So you can see that there is no other um, uh, Y or Z, right? Like no other endogenous variable in the equation for X, which means that there is like um, no direct error coming into, into X, right? Like there's no direct error into X. But if you look now at, at Y, you can see that Y actually depends on X, and that is this error, right? That's how you read it off. And, 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 and Z again has no direct error incoming because there's no argument. And now the question is, well, what are those, you know, uh, bidirected errors that we have on both sides? Well, they are just this thing, right? Like there's the one, one for, for Y and Z and, and one for X and Z, right? So that's really how you read it off. So, so even if you, don't observe the SCM, right? Uh, you might actually observe uh, the causal graph, right? And 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 it's just an induced property. So it, it just comes out of these equations. Okay, so now big question, right? So in causality, we are also often interested because we talk about modeling assumptions, we can look at all kinds of settings, right? And well, we might want to ask ourselves, well, can I just have data from, from this one, right? Like from, from the associations um, and take that essentially to, to reason about experiments, right? Like, um, you know, uh, can, I, can I just um, observe, for example, you know, the, the, the statistics of, of a patient, um, you know, or, or patients taking a certain drug, right, for treatment, um, and, and, and does that tell me something about, you know, how effective that drug is essentially, right? And that's a very relevant question because imagine the, the drug, right? Like it's, it's not tested yet. And then if, if you want to give everyone that same drug, um, that might be unethical, right? It might also be infeasible because of, you know, cost, right? Financial aspects. Um, so it's a very relevant question actually to, to you know, do this cross-layer inference, right? From going to L1 essentially to L2, right? Um, and it turns out, unfortunately, that this, you know, uh, causal hierarchy theorem um, showed that it's, uh, well, impossible. <laughs> um, now you ask, well, isn't that a negative result? Well, it actually is not um, for two reasons. First of all, uh, what does the CHT talk about? It talks about uh, no assumptions, right? So that's really, you know, like in the most general case, if you have no other causal assumptions, then you cannot do it. And in that sense, it's actually a good thing because, well, what's it telling you that, well, causal inference still makes sense. Because imagine they were equal, right? 
well then 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 what's the whole point right like what 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 would be the difference then then i mean we're done in a sense so um in that sense it, it kind of reassures that the formalism that pearl proposed makes sense um and and that we need to talk about assumptions right and that was why i mentioned at the end of chapter one that really you know these assumptions are, are, are a key part so then uh chapter three i'll just pause a second to drink something and ask for questions if there are any Okay, if there are no other questions, then now we get, right, we have discussed now the, the why and the what, and now let's talk finally a little bit about machine learning, right? So, so now we talk about machine learning for causal effects specifically. So what do we see here? So we talked about the cross-layer inference just now, right? Um, and, and actually it becomes feasible, and that's a great relief for our side, if you can put, for example, constraints on the causal graph. So, so here you see this 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 picture from from Barenboim stuff where you have um, the data fusion problem in a sense, right? So, so you are using just observational data. So this is the the layer one, um, and and just from one domain, and and now you're trying to say something about the causal effect, right? Like this thing is is element of L two, and now say you know why X and M are kind of the variables, and say this is the relation that which we observe, right? We we observe that you know M is being caused by X and 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 Y is being caused by M, and there's some kind of confounder between X and Y, yeah. And of course we observe just regular data. This is you know L1 again. This is exactly the thing we mentioned here. So we have L1, right? We we have these constraints, and this is just our question, right? Like this is just something we're asking. So these three things go into this well literally black box right which we call inference engine and um turns out we can then answer whether there is a solution or not like whether you know we can uh go from here to here by using this right um and 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 in this case you can see the solution here right so the quality between you know doing an intervention on x uh, and observing y would be the same as 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 this complicated looking formula which is really just saying like you you average over the M's conditioned on X and then uh, you average over all the other or all, all the X um, for that certain certain M right and, and look at Y and and what this really gives you is you can now go from available distributions to the interventional distribution right so so it is possible right um, the question of course becomes in which case it becomes possible right like like which kind of combinations of of these these factors like are there maybe queries you know with, with, where it doesn't work right or or, or 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 constraints which are insufficient or or what if i don't have enough data because well usually this is just um of 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 some some sample size n right and and maybe if if n is too small then then it will not, will not work um a second question which usually comes up with this one is um how does um uh, or, or how do how does this black box actually work right like what is this black box about and so this is now the celebrate do calculus right uh, if you have heard about do before then chances are that you have heard about this one and and this is really this inference engine right and we are not going to go in detail about these rules now right but really there's just three rules right one two three um and they have intuitive meaning for example you know uh inserting deleting observations uh, changing observations for 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 actions, right, and 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 actually inserting and deleting them, and 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 the great thing about this one is actually it's a complete set of results. So uh, what this tells you is that when we go back to this one, that anything which really has a solution, right, like uh, any any query we could ask that actually has a solution, uh, we we'll get the answer. And even for the ones where we don't have a solution, we'll at least say no, right. So it's a very very powerful tool, and and that was why why this one uh, was was a very uh, yeah successful um, uh, achievement in, in in the field. And um, well, what does this criterion mean though? So this might be important. So so this double dash one in 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 this case is is just equivalent of what we have seen with the previous one with the single dash. So this is really just saying that y is independent of z uh, given x and and w. In the graph G, uh, where you know incident nodes to X were removed, 
And um, what does this mean? Well, this is deseparation, right? So, so deseparation is is a it's a graphical tool. It's something from uh, which which you know if you have had some lectures on probabilistic graphical models, then you'll be familiar. Uh, so, so imagine you have like a graph like this here, uh, a kind of chain structure here between A, C, and B, and um, and say C is given, right? So, so the gray nodes are, are observed. Then what this tells you now here in this structure, the deseparation criterion, that they'll be independent. So, so if I know about C, right, then it will knowing about A will not change my belief about B. That's really what it's saying. And 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 for for chain structures, um, and 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 Fox, this is uh, really um, always given. But interestingly, in this case here, in this last case here. Um, they become independent only if you don't condition on on, on C, right? That's a, uh, a what is known as a collider, right, or or a V structure, right? Because it looks like a V, and 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 well, that's just a property of, of graphs. And and what's usually used in this context is is these things: so global Markov property and, and faithfulness. And what do they tell you? So you the only difference here in this thing is is just this thing, and it's subtle, but it's important. So it's telling you that. However, you find out this using the the deseparation tool um, in the graph uh, will imply the same in the distribution, right? The distribution, your 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 PV, you know, and then you know you'll have some sample of it, and and this will be your x1, y1, z1, right, and and so on and so forth. Your data matrix essentially, right? And it's telling you if if you see it in the graph, then this implies that you'll also see it in in the distribution. And faithfulness is really just the other way around, right? So ideally, we have both properties, and then it turns into an equivalence, right? So, and and why why do we care about this? Well, if if you have both of these things, right, then then you get this below here. This is a local factorization. So the probability of any observation I can make in my system will then be a decomposition according to the parents, right? Like according to these modules. For example, here we would see something like uh, P of, of C uh, given A and B, right? In this case, the, the parent set of C is defined as, as A and, and B, right? So, so that's really what it is about. Um, great thing though, so the do calculus and, and these things we have just seen now, the D separation, uh, if you've seen this for the first time, you probably don't have a chance of understanding immediately, but that's why we have the references and again, always reach out if, if you feel like. Um, if you've seen this before, then still it can be, you know, very overwhelming. Um, but fortunately, there's, you know, a lot of these, you know, free code libraries nowadays, right? And, and there's something like, for example, do why. Uh, this was developed at Microsoft, um, but there's also these causal learn, causal X, and so on and so forth. And and they really can can do the whole procedure, right? Like they can model the causal uh, mechanisms, they can do the do calculus stuff, and then they can use you know the machine learning part essentially to really estimate the causal effect, right? Um, and and this just you know using your input data and some domain knowledge, right? Some some assumptions essentially, right? Like these are the causal assumptions uh, which we which we had before. And 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 this is just you know sample from your your uh, distribution. So on another note now, so I mean, a machine learning, especially lately, right? Like we we talk about deep learning, um, and um, well, neural networks, right? They are the name of the game, and 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 can we have neural networks with SCM? Like what does that mean? And and this was actually a great st question studied by Kevin Chia et al. Um, and and what they did was. Uh, well, parameterize an SCM using neural networks and then train it, right? So, so we could just do a whole lecture on, on, on these models, um, but I have this one slide summary for you here. So, so let's go through it one by one. So there is this true SCM, right? So, so here it's denoted by the same star. Again, as always, we have our variables, you know, as before, for example, the, the, the drug, the recovery, the headache. Um, the the exogenous, the noise terms, the things we don't model, the equations, and a distribution. So remember, this is kind of the key, right? If you have these things, <laughs> then you're done. But usually we don't have that, right? So that's really, sorry, um, that's really the um, um, the the underlying reality, right? Which we want to find out about, but which we don't have access to, right? So so that's why it's great out here. Um, it's hidden. But again. We might observe a graph, right? We we might observe 
you know, that these are the relations, right, of our V1, V2, V3, for instance, right? And so they had the clever idea of saying, okay, well, um, what if you constrain it, right? Like, what if you if you have now this, what they call a neural causal model, which, which just looks like this, right? So, so you see, here's, for example, variable X, variable Z, variable Y, um, and between those, the, the structural equations are modeled by these neural network modules, right? So, so immediately what you also see is that this is a quite complex model, right? Because it's not just a single model, it's, it's actually a set of models, right? Like for each of the structural equations you have, right? For each, you know, x, you know, equals to fx and, and all of the arguments, uh, that thing will be a neural network, right? Yeah, multilayer perceptron. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you see that there's this this very natural way of using the graph to constrain the structure. Um, but now the thing is, you you have to train this thing, right? And 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 usually you you won't observe, uh, you know, the, the the full data. You will you will only observe a sample of it, right? Like like some approximate version of that. Um, and, and you have to cope with that. And these are all the interesting questions that they actually answer in this one. Um, though they may m more look from from a theoretical set of things right they they really ask themselves whether an ncm is 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 equal to 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 an scm right um and so yeah again here we see from the model m right that implies the the pearl causal hierarchy which we saw in the beginning the 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 ladder thing right and l1 l2 l3 and and say now we observe l1 right this is this part here now we train our model and then you know we have this approximation here, and um, now the interesting part though is that you know of course this model also implies the L two, and then you know there could be a question about a causal effect, right? Q for query question, and um, can we use now? Can we use now the M hat, right? Which is this this black box here? Can we use that one now to actually um, yeah do this to do bridge this gap, right? Um, and actually, they showed you can do this, right? That's the very cool thing. So essentially, uh, their conclusions is that uh, you know NCM, uh, you know, are are actually a subset um, of of the uh, of the space of uh, all SCM, right? And um, with that, um, they really kind of cemented these things as as proper causal models, right? And and what was really important to show that yeah, you you can do this. Um, but all, of course, asterisks, uh, you know, again, as always, remember assumptions, right? So, um, but it's it's a very nice way of directly going about it. Um, and um, yeah. Cool. So with this, we actually step into the last part of, of, of this first lecture in the morning, which is, you know, now machine learning for, for causal structures, right? So, so just now we talked about causal effects so so really i want to know about like if i change this thing right like how would it affect it and now i want to know it without even changing that thing you you must imagine i mean that's already a crazy concept actually but now we want to talk more generally about structures right a, a thing we might have missed out from yesterday's lecture but uh we'll catch up a little bit at least now um and so how do we go about on about like learning the underlying structure of something right so here again we'll go step by step so here we have this old school work by 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 Zhang in in 2008, which um, does the causal structure learning, right? The, the CSL uh, using a method which is called fast causal inference (FCI). That that's what they proposed. Uh, and what is the setup really? So the setup is really, again, you you have your your distribution, um, and and now you want to go to to some kind of causal graph, you know, uh, on your on your um, on, on your data, right? And and that's really the setup we're looking at, right? So so we are trying to reverse engineer essentially, right? Like going from the data back to the structure, which is implied by the SCM. And um, how is this done? Well, if you remember a couple of slides back, what we saw was the deseparation and the conditional dependencies. And, and, and this is the, the great deal about these, what I termed here, the, the old school methods, right? That um, still the the latent uh, SCM, you know, it, it's it's not given, it's hidden. But what you observe now is this, right? Like you observe all these uh, conditional 
independencies, dependencies in the data. And what you see exactly here now is that X is actually independent of Y if you if you don't condition on anything, right, on the empty set, um, but not of Z, not of and, and Y and Z, not and and well, X and Y actually become dependent when you have Z in there, right? And so what Zhang really contributed to here was finding a set of complete rules where you can always identify uh, at least an equivalence class of the graph uh, here displayed like this. This is a, a, a park um, partial and, and ancestral graph. And what this really is telling you is that um, so so these funny notes mean uh, that, you know, Z is definitely not an ancestor of X, but we we know we don't know uh, which relation X has to Z. And so there's different options. There's uh, different graphs coming right out of this pack. It's an equivalence class, right? So so all of these these ones, these form a set, right? And this thing here is is really representing uh, all of these different graphs, right? So so in a sense, we cannot identify oh, it's it's that one, right? Like we cannot go for for what it really is, um, given only this data. Um, but we can at least conclude that it's 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 either that or that one or that one or any of those which here remain. And and this might sound very reassuring, but you know this can be problematic, right? Because um, the space of of all DAGs and and the packs it, it scales um, well. The space of all DAGs scales super exponentially with the the number of um, of, of of variables, right? So so if you imagine you have like v and 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 a and 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 b and and so on, the more you have of them, the the more complex, of course, the the graph can get, right? And and the combinations are are, are virtually limitless, right? So um, at least you know very practically. So that's really what you're getting. So so you can definitely deduce the causal structure at least up to an equivalence class, right? Any of 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 those can be problematic, but. This has been long, long time the, the state of the art essentially, right? However, all of this is actually not uh, not everything in a sense, right? So there's been an alternative uh, as of you know recent times to causal structure learning, where you do assumptions on say the function class, right? Like the the functional family that you have. Here. So let's first look again at at the first path so the first option is just as we saw now so you have your your data sample for example for here for these four variable x1 to x4 and then you do your independence tests and it really i mean there's libraries to compute these independencies and and different assumptions and i mean there's merits to all of them right advantages disadvantages but essentially you just get get this list right and now under you know these Faithfulness and Markov assumption, which we saw earlier, right? <clears throat> we can then, you know, conclude uh, either, you know, the graph directly or or some some alternate so, so the equivalence class, right? And usually, usually it will be both of them for path one, right? However, there's now the second path, right, which is restricting the model class. So <clears throat> here, I mean, we know, for example, that that you know these these noise terms, what was previously called the U, right? So the U is the N here. Um, that they are uh, independent of each other, right? And 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 that it uh, that the 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 terms look like this, right? Or or, or what we could also do here is something like um, say, for instance, um, that the noise term is additive, right? So that for example, X uh, is equal to uh, F1, uh, um, and and or or let's do it a bit differently. We write, for example, let's look at X3, for instance, and then, you know, F, F3, and then it's, say, um, you know, dependent of X1, of course, and also on N3, but the noise term is additive, right? So so we have this 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 plus sign here. If we can do something like this, for instance, of course, that is very strong assumptions, but if we can do that, then we might actually be able to, you know, directly get get to the graph, right? So so in this case, um, they they illustrate here very simply um by saying yeah these are the equations and and then of course you can just read it off right but practically you would not have this because this is already this right and you just want to have it but you would have something as i just showed where you have something like okay it depends functionally on this one but additively on on, on that one and 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 this is really i mean uh this is really your your, your function here x1 and and n3 yeah? 
Cool. So, so these are kind of the two approaches and, 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 and this, you know, you could call the, the, the new school in a sense. Um, and, and here are some results, right? So, so here's a, a nice table, which is just summarizing some of them, right? So, so here, DAC, uh, we didn't even mention actually, but it's just, you know, directed uh, a cyclic graph, right? This is your, your, your structure of interest. Usually, I mean, we saw that the SCM has this, uh, uh, a cyclicity assumption, and that's uh, you know the representation of choice in this case. Because directed, of course, because we are talking about you know causes. It's either that, or 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 it's or it's that, and 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 a cyclic that of course we don't want to have these feedback loops. Yeah. And um, here you see now a kind of taxonomy of 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 some of these results. So if you say you have general SCM, right, like any of, of your variables, you know, it's just a general function of its parents and some noise. Um, well, <laughs> unfortunately, you'll have bad luck because, well, it's 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 proven impossible. Okay? However, uh, if you say, say now you have additive noise models, right? So, so again, this was the thing we saw with, say, uh, here and, 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 and then this thing, right? Um, then it's suddenly uh, different, right? Like you can actually identify the DAC, which is really, really good, right? But under the assumptions that that this thing here, that the Fs are nonlinear, right? Um, and then you see there's some of these other results, right? For example, uh, which is maybe a bit surprising at, at for, for some who will see this the first time, right? But it's something like that the linear Gaussian setting, right? So so you have a linear model now. So, so you know actually that, for example, here the X3 is actually just you know uh, some some coefficient alpha and and, and x3 right um, and and additive with you know some noise and and this one is 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 a Gauss right so so say zero one um, then it's actually not identifiable um, and and you know this has something to do with with the fact that when you look at the bell curve right uh, and, and and its symmetry and, and these things right so you see that you know in causality again we talk about all these modeling assumptions. And, and now if we do machine learning, if we want to estimate and so on and so forth, um, it's well worth looking at the theory because it can already tell you like, oh yeah, you can do this or you cannot, right? And in some case, you, you actually cannot. On a totally different note, but also very related to causality for machine learning with structures, right? Like specifically, um, in, in, in 2012, there was this very, very nice and interesting paper by, by Bernard Chukov and others where they showed that um, the, the semi-supervised learning setting, right? So, so the setting where you don't just have, you know, your, your X and Y pairs and, and Y is the true one, but where you also just have some X samples, right? Where, where you say to yourself, okay, well, I, I learned the mapping from, you know, um, X to Y, but how can this also help uh, make, make it better, right? Like um, I, I observed just more samples and, and how can I fit them in there? And, and turns out what they show here is um, that semi-supervised learning uh, will, will just work in the anti-causal direction, right? Um, what is causal, what's anti-causal? Again, if, if you have a cause and, and, and it's causing the, the effect E, right? Then, then this is the causal direction, right? And, and, and going the other way in the prediction is then the anti-causal. And what they really just showed, right? Like you look at the causal stuff and, and it's 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 not really working, right? Um, but then you look at the semi-supervised learning and it's um, perfectly working, right? Like you can see this clear clear difference here, right? Um, and, and, and what they really show with this is that, um, well, the structure really dictates what you can learn because in machine learning, right? Whether, you know, I, I predict my, my MNIST, uh, you know, a, a, a three, or, or I, I go the other way around. I mean, usually I'll do this classification, right? And now what this really is telling you is that if you don't go into the anti-causal direction, right, uh, then you can only do it. Then you can only benefit. And why is that so? Well, it, it's so because um, when you when you go with the causal direction, um, then there's this thing of, you know, the independence of the probability of, of your cause and, and the probability of your effect given the cause, right? Like this is the mechanism, right? This is the mechanism and this is the cost distribution. And um, they should be independent, right? Like they, they should be independent. So so that's really what's happening here. Cool. Um, so I think we're getting to, to the close of, of, of this one. 
of this first session. Um, and really, what we have all seen now, we kind of realize, uh, I think it's a quite fitting quote for, from Pearl by himself. Um, you know, as X-rays are to the surgeon, graphs are for causation, right? And and we really saw these graphs are everywhere, right? And and that's the the S in in the SCM, right? The structural causal model. Um, and and I actually always like to adapt this kind of you know quote. I, I like to say something like you know as graphs are to causality because they're super necessary. Well, causal nets are for AI, right? Um, and 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 what I want to say here is that even if we haven't seen maybe the most impressive results so far with with applications, right? I mean the whole name of the game was first you know getting you know a language and 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 and, and formalizing this. And then, I mean, there's several important theoretical results and, I mean, a lot more attention now for, for just the pure machine learning view. And it's very clear that any of these, these levels, right, like be it L1, L2, L3, well, all of them we want to be able to answer, right, in, in, in some way. And, and, and here we have a language to specify them. So, uh, and, and even in the language of probability, which is usually the language of ML. So, um, it, it, it just seems like a natural fit. And so without further ado, I'll just give a couple of more announcements, um, you know, opportunities following this, this summer school. So there's this discussion group, as, as, as said in the very, very beginning of this lecture, um, you know, there's this, this weekly discussion group, and here's also the link, right, discusscausality.link. And, you know, we have a Slack channel where, you know, people can ask questions. Everyone is welcome. It's open. We have the recordings from the past sessions. And, um, uh, yeah, it's 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 live sessions, and and the, the focus is really on, on on the discussions, right? Like we have the first authors ideally coming up, and 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 uh, alongside slides discussing their papers, right? Um, and then the second thing is uh, at this year's NIRIPS, um there will be this workshop on on neurocausal and, and and symbolic AI, right? So it's going to cover a lot of concepts we've seen today, right? Especially the 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 NCM type of things, right? But also logic, right? Like good old-fashioned AI and all these kinds of things, right? And 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 again, here's the website, and 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 rest assured, the slides will be shared with you. Um, yeah. Also, if you want to stay in touch, right? In general, uh, here's my Twitter handle, um, and I also have like a blog post. I, I post about all kinds of things, whether it be maths or sports, right? Like, um, yeah. Feel free to reach out. Feel free to check that out. Um, and yeah, that's that's a wrap for for. Causal machine learning one, uh, and yeah, let's let's do some questions if there are any, and uh, otherwise we see each other later at at causal machine learning two. Are there any questions? <clears throat> I didn't see anything in the chat box. Uh, yeah, me neither. Mm, I, I hope I didn't. Uh, you know, like. Oh, so, um, uh, it first. seems uh, not, but uh, maybe. Uh, I have, I have uh, <clears throat> some, <laughs> if I can. Of course, of course. <laughs> if I'm allowed to. You're uh, allowed to. <laughs> uh, mm, now uh, you have this IID assumption in machine learning. Uh, how far you can go with causal beyond that, really? What about if you have heterogeneous effects and basically if you move uh, from this IID uh, uh, with causal uh, graph, uh, you are on a uncharted territory as well as in uh, when you are doing machine learning model. Yeah, so so that's a very good and important question. Um, in general, what we see usually is that you know that's what we saw in the very beginning with uh, where we had something like you know the the statistical. Uh, is is being you know subsumed by by the causal, and and really what this telling you is that um, the the statistical is is uh, 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 just a, a subset of 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 the causal, and so you have all the problems from statistical learning theory plus the causal ones, right? And I think that gives okay. a good answer to the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh... And another one is uh, maybe I did not understand uh, completely this relation with uh, semi-supervised learning and uh, causal uh, uh, causal or structural causal models. Uh, 
and uh, but uh, we had a student that actually uh, spending uh, he he did the PhD semi supervised learning and uh, just in practical terms uh, I think uh, uh, tried most of the algorithms that were around tracking his own also but uh, you observe that sometimes this uh, semi supervised learning works well. And uh, it works great, and sometimes it does not work at all. Yes, yes, yes. And, and uh, I don't know if you can comment now. Uh, uh, would uh, would these uh, causal structures help in constructing algorithms that actually can utilize unlabeled data in such sense that basically the semi-supervised learning? And that is the point actually. Uh, that that uh, this is probably uh, the only way uh, you can prove that, uh, that this causal uh, learning uh, is actually working. It's doing better predictions uh, out of the box, out of the domain, out of the applicability domain. Isn't it so? Yeah, so so that's a great point. So so really, what I was just showing earlier uh, with this paper by by um, by Bernard Chilkov and others, um, it's a great result, right? Because uh, just to summarize, what the result is really giving you is that you know you you want to do now semi-supervised learning. You're interested in that, and 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 you said like sometimes it, it, it's working and 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 sometimes it's not working, right? Um, and the question is like which are those cases, right? Like where it works and where it doesn't work. And, and and they give you an answer. They give you a clear, clear answer. They say oh. uh, this case is is anti-causal, right? And then of course, as you anticipate, the the case where it doesn't work is the causal way. And and that sounds weird, but like what it really just means is like when when you when you decide on your variables, right? Like A, B, your features essentially in in the in in machine learning, right? Um, then of course these features will be related some somehow, right? So say your feature A is causing feature B. Um, that is the causal direction, right? And 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 the other error would be the anti-causal direction. And and in machine learning, you might actually be interested in predicting A from B, which is the anti-causal direction, right? And so what their result is telling you is semi-supervised learning will work. But if you say now, okay, I want to predict B from A which is, you know, the, the causal direction. And it's just a question of, of what you want to predict and, and then how the actual model looks in reality. Well, then the answer is semi-supervised learning will not work, right? And that's the, mm -hmm. the, the, the interesting thing. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know Thank if, you. Uh, if uh, uh, anybody was uh, stimulated uh, with this discussion. No. <laughs> and then you uh, then you have some uh, some time to recover, Mate. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, and that uh, then we meet at uh, oh ten forty five. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. It was very thank nice. you too. Um, so see you yeah. in a, see you in a bit. Yeah.